Okay, thank you very much for coming, everybody. Um, this is supposed to be a quickie talk, isn't it? So I'll get through this quickly. That's me. I've been working at ThoughtWorks for three and a half years, and I find it very difficult to recognize people. That's a marketing slide from ThoughtWorks. If you're interested in ThoughtWorks, come and talk to me afterwards. I'll give you some time. And there's lots of books that people from our company have written. What am I going to be talking about today? Well, uh, it's the A to Z of driven development stuff. Um, some of them you'll have heard of, some of them you will not. How did this come about? Well, I was working for ThoughtWorks in a place in the UK called Darlington. Uh, if you've ever been to Darlington, which I'm going to doubt that anybody has, you'll know that it's not the greatest place in the world. There are all my colleagues there. You see us all wearing those Darlington t-shirts, which we had made because we we're so proud of working there. One day at work, um, we started talking about test-driven development, behavior-driven development, and then some more odd things like Fowler-driven development, failure-driven development. And then we ended up basically going to the pub that night and we decided we would do a whole A to Z of this stuff. And this is the blog post that resulted from it, which I then shared with ThoughtWorks people and it sort of went viral internally. And um, loads of people read my blog post, which I was quite amazed about. Uh, so here's, here's the highlights of it. The actual A to Z that we did, we did it in one go. The only rule we had was that you couldn't make stuff up. Had to be stuff that you'd actually done. So you had to be able to cite a project or a place that you'd worked where you'd actually done this stuff. So some of these you'd have heard of, some probably not. Start with A, AWS driven development. This is when everything you've done in your company gets ported onto AWS. And if there isn't a tool for it in the AWS marketplace, you just can't do it. Behavior driven development, that's a thing. I'm sure a lot of people have heard of it. Also B, we have bleeding edge driven development. This is when you only use stuff that is absolutely spot on brand new. If there's been a conference about this product, you're not allowed to use it, oh, except maybe if it's an unconference. If there's even a stable build out there, you know, some people are going to think twice, it's not bleeding edge enough. Also B, nice word in English, bullshit driven development. I'm sure we've all had a developer in our team who says, oh yeah, yeah, I know this technology, it's great, it's perfect for what we do. So you roll it out there, you make the decision, you start using it, some months later, Turns out that person was lying. They didn't have an absolute clue about this technology. They've never used it. But you've already gone down that road. You're too far down. That person's also left the company. So you're just in a complete mess. I think a lot of us have been guilty of this in the past. C stands for career-driven development. You take a decision to use the technology to do something so that your career improves. Closely related to that in English is CV-driven development. That's like career-driven development, except you fully intend to leave the company. D, domain-driven development, that's a thing. Also, we have something called developer-driven development. This is when the developers sit down and decide what they're going to do. Again, based on usually developer experience. We had this in a company that I worked in. It was a public sector company in the UK. We had Java microservices. Everybody was bored by that. So to try and promote a bit of staff retention, we wrote all new microservices in, this wasn't my decision, in Clojure. Just sometimes the right thing to do, sometimes the wrong thing to do. Six months or a year later, all these Clojure devs that we've created started leaving the company for higher paid jobs. And we couldn't afford to employ people now because we had to advertise for Clojure developers. E stands for ego-driven development. I'm not a fan of that. It's what rock stars do. Martin Fowler. Anybody in this room from the UK? No, so the Martin Fowler joke's not going to work. That's the real Martin Fowler. Fowler-driven development is when you only do stuff that Martin Fowler has just blogged about. You read his blog and you absolutely change to doing that thing. And you get extra points on this one, and this has happened to a friend of mine. If you phone up one of your mates that works for ThoughtWorks and ask for a, for a clarification, oh, I've read Martin Fowler's play. I mean, yeah, as if he talks to us about what he writes about. <laughs> also, the game of whack-a-mole represents failure-driven development. Has anybody ever worked in a team where you fix one thing, release it, and that breaks this other thing over here, so you fix that and release it, and six months later you realize you've actually done nothing? You've just been fixing the same failures over and over and over again. G stands for Google-driven development. It's very much like AWS-driven development, except uh, the tool set's slightly different. H, hypothesis-driven development. Now, that is a good thing. We try and promote that all the time. 
I'm not going to say too much about that. Also, it stands for Hype Driven Development, which is, of course, only the next big thing. And also in H, H is a fruitful letter. We have Hippo Driven Development. Again, I don't know if this works outside of the UK. Do you know the concept of a hippo? Hippo is the highest paid person's opinion. In the, what that means is you have a meeting with about 20 people in it. Like 19 of these people are actually going to do the work, but one person in the room is the highest paid person. So that opinion counts. So you'll talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. And then the hippo makes the decision, even if that person outvoted the rest of the room one to 20. I and J come together. You have IntelliJ driven development, which is essentially when you join a new code base and you just keep pressing Alt Enter and Alt Enter and it tells you to change loads of stuff as you go along. You don't really have to think about what you're doing here, but it makes it, you know, when you commit stuff, it looks like you've made loads of changes that were really sensible, you know? Things like uh, access to hidden closure or something, I can't remember, it used to come up in .NET. Also known as Alt Enter driven development, of course. And JetBrains driven development is exactly the same thing but they're conveniently next to each other in the alphabet. KISS driven development, we'll keep that one simple. And then you have Kangaroo driven development. Uh, I was struggling when I wrote this one, I remember, and uh, it's when you bounce around from one priority to the next because the, the product owner is either clueless or is very weak or is being poked in lots of different directions. So you never really know what the team purpose is, you never really know what you're doing. I thought that one was a bit weak, but then somebody phoned me up the day after this blog post went live and said, we do that all the time. <laughs> so it, it genuinely exists. Thank you very much. Go horse, it's called in Brazil, apparently. Well, there you go. L stands for lifestyle driven development. Now, um, this is when your team gets caught up in what I consider to be ridiculous conversations that go on and on and on. It could be whether we have a three space indent or a four space indent, whether the curlies go on the next line or the same line and all that stuff. And then you, you get edit wars in your, in your GitHub and it's, it's just ridiculous. I, I, as tech lead, I never get involved in such conversations. I just leave it to the people who care about it. That's lifestyle driven development. M is marketing driven development. So this is when your business goes and starts a marketing campaign, doesn't give you any warning about it and says, oh, by the way, in three months, this marketing campaign is happening. So you have to have the functionality ready to support it. Doesn't matter if it's feasible or not, you've got to do it. Also, M um, stands for Moscow development. Moscow driven, that's a thing. Stands for must, should, could, would. It's a way of prioritizing. It's not a bad thing. N, negativity driven development. Oh, easy for me to say, hey? Negative of neg negativity. This is when somebody or whole team is obsessed with working out all the failure cases there possibly are, absolutely hundreds of them, writes everything, takes so long, everything, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll work, but you blow the whole budget for the whole product on the first story and nothing ever goes live. The opposite of that, of course, is O for optimism driven development. This is when the team knows their code is going to work, right? So I don't need to write tests. I don't need to write integration tests. I don't need to write contract tests. Why would I need to do all that stuff? It's brilliant. Goes to market within like a week. The company's really pleased, except and then, of course, everything goes on fire within seconds. P. This is not a bad book, Patterns, Design Patterns. It's quite a famous book. Uh, some people are obsessed with patterns, you have patterns driven development, they won't sit down and write a line of code before they've hacked out and would, had this massive conversation about what pattern we're going to use, what pattern we're going to use. Just waste loads of time, it's just, just do the job. Patterns driven development is an anti-pattern. Also P stands for politics driven development, which is of course where all your prioritization is, is done along the lines of, well this isn't the most important thing, but those people will really shout loudly at us, so let's do them. Q stands for QA de driven development. It's definitely a thing. I tried to Google it and find loads of things when the QAs are really involved in the process. Everywhere it was called tester driven development, but we had nothing else beginning with Qs, so we had to go with this. Ah, oh, which had that explanation there. R, well, R is the .NET version of INJ. Stack Overflow driven development. Now, I'm sure we've all done this. It's when people just cut and paste stuff out of Stack Overflow without ever really understanding it. You will find your code base littered with comments that say, I don't really know what this bit does, but it was there in Stack Overflow. 
And of course, sales-driven development. This, is, this happens in startups a lot. It used to happen to me a lot in my life as a startup person. The, the CEO would come back having made a deal with somebody, a new partner, and said, oh, yeah, I sold them this, I sold them this. We can do this, right? And, oh, God. How long have we got? TDD, nothing more to say about that. Now, what does U stand for? Hmm. That is underwear-driven development. When you have distributed teams, often people are working at home. When you do the daily stand-up in the morning, you can tell who the person is in the group that still win, win their pants because their screen on, the, on whatever your conferencing tool is will just say, John's iPhone. Value-driven development is a very good thing. Waterfall-driven development, I really sincerely hope none of us is still doing that. And of course, there's Wagile-driven development. God, well, that's like fake Agile. I'll be talking about that later. X stands for XD-driven development. That man there is the global head of XD from ThoughtWorks. XD-driven development is great. I've only done it in one group. One company had a really strong XD department, and they did all the research out there and got everything done. It worked wonderfully well, but I've only seen it once. Uh, OK, you ain't going to need that one. And Z stands for zealot-driven development, when somebody really drives everybody on in the team and that person gets them going forward. And that's how we made that blog post that I mentioned earlier. I wouldn't let us go and sit down and order our food for dinner until we'd finished. So by doing that, we got it all done in that one sitting. So some of that makes sense, some of it doesn't. So this got me onto thinking, if I'm going to talk about this at a conference, I can't just go through to the A to Z. I want to make some sort of comment about what's gone on. So here's a list of all the stuff that I've mentioned. I think there's about 40 on there from the original blog post. And I thought, well, which of those are good and which of those are bad? So I grouped them together. You probably can't read that, but it doesn't. Oh, it's not bad on the massive screen. I might have to take a photo of that. So there's some good ideas. There's some bad ideas. OK, that's not that useful. So I thought, well, OK, what about stuff that we sort of made up and stuff that is like real things that you can Google? And that looks like that. Now, interestingly, I noticed a very big correlation between the previous two slides. And then I started thinking about, well, actually, some of these talk to how we build stuff. Some of them talk to what it is we're going to build. And some of them are tools and technology based. So if we look at this grouping again, we'll, again, we'll see there's quite a strong correlation between these slides and the earlier ones. Just trust me, you haven't got time to read them. So, I took the middle bit out because actually I think sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad when we talk about uh, basing our strategy on particular technologies. Sometimes it can be good, sometimes it can be bad. Then I looked at the two groups I've got left, and bear in mind, this, there's quite a strong correlation. So I thought, what if I take the city things out of the top group, and that happens, we lose four. And then if I take the sensible things out of the bottom group, what happens there? Well, we only lose two. So what does that mean? Well, We've got loads of sensible ideas about how to build things. And we've got loads of stupid ideas about what it is that we're going to build. Why would that be? Well, you'll be surprised to hear that I've got a hypothesis. And here it is. When it comes to talk about how to build stuff, we, the developers, have typically been the ones that have come up with the ideas in this space. It's our lives that we're dealing with there. We talk about how we would like to do things. So those ideas are typically sensible ideas. Let us get on with it. When it comes to what to build, I think a lot of companies still struggle with this. Throughout the history of software development, the product owner, well, that's a relatively new concept. The way that we decide what to build has typically been a bit haphazard. It's changed over time. Sometimes it's not clear who owns stuff. So here's my solution to this. How do we decide what to build? Number one, arrange your teams around customer-facing outcomes. Number two, look at all the teams you've got, decouple them from each other. This message, I, th I always end up coming back to this message. Number three, get a good product owner and trust them to get on with it. Number four, Get the product owner just to tell the teams what the most important thing is. Don't need to do anything else. Do that thing, the most important thing. Every time you make a decision, just do that. What's the most important thing to do? Then go back to step four. And if you do that, hopefully, you'll have a sensible way of deciding what drives your development. Thank you very much.